Lighthouse Church presents the following message by Pastor Jason Holloman. Amen. Now, uh, do you want to? Be- if you don't believe that God has a sense of humor, I have, I have some evidence for you if you'd like it. So this is Family Worship Weekend, right? So we've got kids in here. It's great. And a ca- so we have a pretty good idea of what we're doing in the future. Like I, I know every passage and sermon and you know, to the end of the year and most of next year. So we have a pretty good idea of, you know, structuring things. And we also know that on the quarter we have member meetings or, or, or family meetings. We have all these things, right? There's lots going on. And then occasionally the, all of these calendars will intersect in funny ways. And here's how you know God has a sense of humor. This is Family Worship Weekend. We've got kids in here. And our passage today is on the Antichrist. <laughs> Like, as I'm looking a couple of weeks ago, like, oh, yeah, Family Worship Weekend, okay, yes, we're going to announce this, we're going to do this, and I look at the text, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. And so I thought, man, wouldn't it be awesome to, like, have hand motions or something and be like, hey, guys, turn in your Bibles, ah, you know, like, I, it's just, the, like, what do you do for Family Worship week, Weekend? There, nothing says, welcome to Lighthouse Church, like, let's study the Antichrist. I don't know if you know this or not, but that doesn't, um, that doesn't add members uh, studying the Antichrist, but that is where we are faithfully in our text. So if you have a Bible, turn in 1 John chapter 2, and we'll begin in verse 18. 1 John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18. Now I'm going to do what I can uh, to get us uh, out of this message in a timely way, but it is going to be a challenge as you would expect. Now this is a passage of assurance In fact, I asked Daniel uh, five minutes before the sermon started, hey, can we sing a different song? And he's like, we can, but, you know, that would be pretty tough. I said, this this passage really, to me, for those of you that grew up in the hymnal church, how many of you grew up in a hymnal church? Anybody? Okay, a couple of you. Uh, How many of you don't know what a hymnal is? Anybody? (laughs) Straight up, boys, yeah. My own son doesn't know what a hymnal is. You don't know what a hymnal is? (laughs) Man. I promise I care for my children. Man, again, laugh it up. It's harder than you think. Right? Yeah, so like in the hymnal, we have the song, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance. You know the song? Yeah, so every time I read this passage, it feels to me like the song, Blessed Assurance. And so, friends, let's read our passage uh, for today. First John chapter 2, beginning in verse 18, all the way through 29. A reading of God's word. Children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. And if they had been us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that it might become plain that they are not of us. But you have been anointed by the Holy One. And you have you, and you all have knowledge. I write to you not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it, and because no lie is in the truth. Who who is the liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist. He who denies the Father and the Son. Now, no one denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son also has the Father. Verse 24. Let what you heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you have heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has made to us, eternal life. I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. Verse 27, but the anointing that you received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you, but as his anointing teaches you about everything and is true and is no lie, just as it has taught you, abide in him. Verse 28, and now little children abide in him. So that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. And if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. 
Now, in this passage, it starts in a way that's so helpful. And so we don't have a good English translation. Again, we talked about this just a bit before, remember? Hansel, Gretel, the L in German is to say little, right? So Hans, Hansel is little, little Hans, and Gret, Gretel is little Gret, right? And so we have, we have similar things in other languages, but we don't have it in English. We just don't have, uh, I guess if, if a man's named Tim, when he's a kid, you call him Timmy, right? So there's a, there's a few little things like that, but this is different than that even. What we have here is children, but really what it is is loved children. In fact, the NIV gets it really well. Um, my dear children. That's what the NIV translation. My ESV doesn't give it uh, that much flavor. But this is intended to be written to people that are deeply loved. So John, remember, he's an older dude now. He's, on, he's in Ephesus, likely. And at this point, he's probably five or so years away from death. And, and so in, in about two or three years away from writing Revelation, the very last book of the Bible. And so we know, we know that he is writing as an older man to this younger person or church. And he says, my dear children, it is the last hour, and you have heard that the Antichrist is coming. Now, in Greek, anti means two things. It can mean the opposite of. It can mean like, so it's like, if is it white? No, is it black? It's black or white. That's kind of opposites. But it also can mean opposed to. So when I was in student ministry, uh, I am notorious for games that kind of can get students hurt. <laughs> so that was kind of what I was known for. It's like, hey, we can go to Prestonwood. That was a big youth ministry in the area. Or we can go to Ridgecrest where you might get hurt, right? And I, I think that it was a, a drawing for students, right? So we would always have like jalapeno eating contests. You'd probably get hurt, right? Those kind of things. One of the games that I would play is how far can you go? And the game is simple. It's you just get next to a, another person, right? And you push against them. And then and every step you take sideways, you also have to take a step back. And so what you end up doing is you have two people that start this way, but then they start slowly moving away from each other. And before you know it, you've got these two people who are hanging on by dear life. And whoever falls first, the second falls, falls fast as well. Because they depend on each other. They're, they're literally in opposition of each other. And so if one falls, boom, the other's gone too. And the best part about the game is this. There's not a winner. There's just two losers. <laughs> now, I wouldn't tell the students this. I would just say, hey, let's play a super fun game. There's always a winner. There's not a winner. No, no. Just two people falling on the ground. And the student ministry erupts in joy. <laughs> and then I would open the Bible and teach them from the scriptures. See? I really loved being a student pastor. It was fantastic. And, and, and that's anti. So that's to say that when something pushes, like in this silly youth ministry game, the other person has to push just as hard because of the tension of this thing. That is a part of what this Greek word means, is that it's not just the opposite of something. It is literally the push against something. So when we talk about this idea of Christ, when we talk about the Antichrist, that is to say the kingdom is advancing. Praise God for that. The kingdom's advancing. In fact, what a beautiful day today of kingdom advancement. But that is to say there is a domain of darkness that is also pushing against the advancement of the kingdom. Now, um, I, I have this amazing uh, worksheet that I've dug up from some random seminary class. I, I literally don't know who to attribute it to. I would if I knew. It's just amazing notes. But listen to the different names of the Antichrist. So we have the Antichrist here in, in 1 John, unique to 1 John. We also have uh, the, the name the Assyrian in, uh, in Isaiah. We have uh, the beast in Revelation 11. We have the lawless one. We're going to turn to that passage here in 2 Thessalonians. We have the prince of Tyre. We see that from the book of Ezekiel. And we have the son, the son of perdition. We're going to see that again here in just a bit. And, and in each of these points, what we see is the advancement of Christ and then this up opposition. Now, you might be saying, man, come on, man. Isn't this a little bit like weird stuff? Like, isn't this the weird stuff? Like, what about love? What about love? Like, just love. Well, yes. Yes, absolutely. But it's so important that you see from the absolute beginning, there has always been the plan of God. That is to say, the plan of God in the Messiah and a demonic opposition that literally culminates in the anti 
Christ. If you have a Bible, I want to read for you uh, the Proto-Evangelium, which is a big fancy word to say first gospel. And, and commentators have been calling this from Genesis chapter 3, the, the first gospel. Genesis chapter 3. I mean, Genesis chapter 3, verses 15. We, sin has barely entered the world. And what do we have here? In Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. In fact, just recently a staff member said, it doesn't say that. Does it say that? And I said, read it. It does say that. Seed of, of the man, and, and, or excuse me, seed of the woman and seed of of the serpent, that is to say, literal progeny in the future. Genesis chapter 3, beginning of verse 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman. Who is, who is um, God the Father talking to? He's talking to Satan. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. Wait, say it again. Between Satan's offspring and your offspring, Eve's offspring. And he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise, and you shall bruise his heel. From the very beginning, there has always been a plan of God to bring about Messiah. That's the plan. In fact, if you want to understand the Old Testament, the Old Testament is the ushering in of all that has to take place for Jesus to emerge as the Messiah, as the Christ. That's always been the plan. It's never been a different plan. What has always been the plan of the enemy, of Lucifer, from the very beginning, from, from the very beginning in the garden, to come up with a false gospel, to come up with a false Messiah, to come up with an anti-Christ. Now, I don't have, I'm, uh, Jeff and I were talking about this this morning, I, I'm going to print this or email this or do something very helpful uh, in, in getting it to you at some point. Maybe I'll just, just text all of this information, I won't. But just, but just let me just give you just a very fast illustration of what we're talking about this. This is a significant, under, this needs to be significantly felt for us to continue on in this passage of assurance. The Antichrist is versus Christ. The Antichrist is accepted by men, 2 Thessalonians. Jesus was rejected by men, Isaiah 53. He's boastful in speech, Daniel chapter 7. Jesus spoke with authority, Matthew chapter 7. He will come to his own, Daniel 11. He came, oh, he came to do his own will, Daniel chapter 11. Jesus came to do the will of the Father, John 6. He came up from a bottom, bottomless pit, Revelation 11. Again, the beast. He came down from heaven, John 3, 13. He has a covenant. He comes with signs and wonders. Jesus came with signs and wonders. Covenant with Israel. He will have a covenant with Israel. Defies the temple. Jesus cleanses the temple. Limited public work, just present on earth for a few years. Limited public work, Jesus was only on the earth for three and a half years. Mortally wounded, Jesus was mortally wounded. The object of worship, Jesus is the object of worship. Do you see, I mean, I could literally keep going. Do you see the plan of the enemy here? This is significant. Why is this significant? Because we're about to find out, we're about to find out what it looks like. It's a test. We're about to find out what it looks like for people to, Walk in the faith. And, and this becomes critical in understanding that Jesus is the Christ. He is the plan of God. Like if you're like, man, I'd really like to know, oh, I don't know, how to know God. The path, the answer is Jesus. You know, I just kind of have this God-shaped hole in my heart and I just want to know how it's filled. The answer is the person of Jesus. Now, John here says, little children, it is the last hour. As you've heard, the Antichrist is coming. So now many Antichrists have now come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Now, hold on now. So we have the Antichrist person, right? An actual person. And you do not want to get into how I think that's going to happen. That is super unhelpful. But I love talking about it. <laughs> and listen, who doesn't have like some rando book for some rando author? Right? It's like, hey, read this book. It tells you everything you need to know. <laughs> it's like, wasn't that written like in the 80s? Because that's when all the good ones were written. Right? Cold War. Somehow the Cold War, really. Like Gorbachev's, you know, little thing on his head. Everybody knew he was the Antichrist. Right? <laughs> Everybody knew. Steve Jobs bit Apple. Certainly the Antichrist. In fact, let me just get to verse 19 so I can get to this note. Because I'm going to talk about that. 
They went out from us. Well, who went out? The Antichrists. So, so this is important. So if, if I'm walking in as a Christian, so I walk into a Starbucks, where all the non-Christians are, <laughs> and I say, hey, I'm a Christian. Like, nobody thinks that I'm Jesus. Nobody thinks I'm Christ. Oh, are you saying you're the Messiah? No, I'm not the Messiah. I'm a Christian. I'm a little Christ. Remember, it, people made fun of us. People made fun of Christians. They were like, oh, look at those little Christs. They think they're little Christs. That's what this spirit of antichrists are. So when it says the antichrists have come, that is to say, those who follow the spirit of the antichrist. And we're going to get into what that means here in just a bit. So, Christ, so Christians who follow Christ, the spirit of antichrist follow the antichrist. We know that it's the last hour. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. If they were, had been of us, they would have continued with us. Now, what does that mean? Are they saying, like, they would have stayed in our church? Is that what they're saying? No. Like, if they, listen, if they had been with us, they would have stayed at Lighthouse Church. Look at those dogs just leaving this church. No. No, the kingdom's enormous. This is creedal. This isn't, like, this isn't ecclesial. This isn't about the church. No, if they were of us, they would have remained with us. In what way? In creed. Not like in location. No, the gospel advances. Listen, so many of you guys are going to leave this church. It's okay. Advance the kingdom. We are not to huddle up. We're to advance the kingdom. That's why every time somebody leaves the church, like, hey, man, I really feel called to go somewhere else. I literally want to pull them up here and say, they're leaving. They've served us. Praise God. Let's bless them because the kingdom is advancing. We're not going to huddle up. How, how do I know? Because every time Christians huddle up, literally, you know what the Lord does? He's like, I'm going to scatter those guys. <laughs> like if we huddle up, he will scatter us anyway. Might as well do it on your own accord. <laughs> so you should go to Nineveh. Now it's Bible humor for those of you that know the Bible. If you don't know, just come at me later and we'll just talk about it. Now, they went out that it may become plain that they are not of us. Now, the best, the best way to understand what the Bible is saying is to use the Bible. Just, just Bible study method, hermeneutic method. I love commentaries. I read a ton of them. I love sermons from super old, uh, old-time sermons well before 1900. They're my favorites. Uh, love them. The best way to understand what the Bible is saying is from other passages in the Bible. And so we don't yet know what it means, but you have been anointed. We don't really know what that means. And we don't really know why these folks left and they're called spirit of the Antichrist. But we're about to find out. Verse 21. I write to you, not because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. And because no lie is in the truth. A Spurgeon, again, one of the guys that I like to to listen to the sermons of. In fact, I had a chance to paint yesterday for a long time. And I know some of you like to listen to music. I like to listen to Spurgeon sermons on repeat while I'm painting. Now, I know that sounds like torture for some of you. It is glorious. It is so, if you have not tried it, try listening to Spurgeon sermons on repeat for like 12 hours. <laughs> you do not know how glorious it is. Now, Spurgeon says, the illumination in the Bible you may read the Bible continuously and yet never learn anything about it unless it is illuminated by the Spirit. Then the words shine forth like stars. What a blessed thing to read an illuminated Bible lit up by the radiance of the Holy Spirit. Have you read the Bible and yet have your eyes unenlightened? Go and say, O oh Lord, illuminate it, shine upon it, for I cannot read it, and it cannot profit me unless you illuminate it. It's a powerful quote. Now, verse 22. Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? Okay, so what is the spirit of Antichrist? It's those who say Jesus is not the Christ. That's who it is. Now, this is important. Is it those that uh, chew tobacco? Huh? Huh? Is it those that dance? I can keep on going. Is it that? No, no. Listen, we're not talking about sinners here. We're talking about those who are apostate, those who are truly opposed, 
anti-Christ. Look, most of the folks that are in the Bible Belt currently, currently, are just people who are sound asleep. They're just, they're just being choked out by the riches and pleasures of the earth. They don't have any thoughts about Christ. No, the, the spirit of Antichrist is those who say, did Jesus really say? It is those that are opposed to Jesus. So, if, man, if you're in here and you're like, man, I just want to live my life and be quiet. I just, I just don't really care about church. And, man, this whole thing's exhausting. Like, all this seems pretty great, but I'm hoping to not come back. Man, that's not the spirit of Antichrist. That, that's being lulled to sleep by the cares and riches of the age. That's what that is. If you come in and you say, man, I'm just exhausted by this or this, or I just keep falling into temptation and I'm grieved by my sin, that just sounds like you're a good old-fashioned believer in Jesus Christ. So this, this is different, friends, than, than what we're talking about, those that are lulled to sleep by the cares and pleasures of the age or those that are exhausted in their sin. Remember, the Bible says that, that for the Christian, when we're in sin, our bones waste away. It's exhausting. You can almost see it on people. It's like, man, friend, you look exhausted. What's going on, right? Now, verse 23. No one denies the son. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me go back to, to 22. The one who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. This is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Well, why are we bringing up the Father and the Son? I thought we were just talking about Jesus. It's answered in the next verse. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son also has the Father. So do you see what's happening here? That you cannot say, look, I don't believe in Jesus, but man, I love God the Father. It doesn't work that way. To deny Christ is to deny the Father. This was the stumbling block. This was the stumbling block of the Jews. This is the stumbling block here. In fact, even now, when I'm working with and talking with those that are uh, Jewish, and I'm, I'm like, hey, listen, deny the Son, you don't have the Father. Man, you want to talk about offensive. It's deeply offensive. Now, verse 24 begins to shift in this passage towards a encouragement and assurance for the believer. Thank God for that, because this antichrist language can be super overwhelming, because for the Christian, you could be looking at this going, man, what are we, well, this is heavy stuff. Like, we're talking about the beast in Revelation. We're talking about the, the man of lawlessness, the son of perdition. This is a significant thing. And yet, the, the reason why I think this is so powerful here is because so many of us in this moment want to go to some kind of special knowledge or whatever it is. Th this is what's interesting here. Some of the Gnostics at this time, and so when John is writing, he is writing a letter to them, but it's, it's for us. So he's writing a letter to this church. And at the time, there was a Gnostic belief. And part of Gnosticism is that there's special, special knowledge that nobody can have. It's secret. You got to do certain things to have it. And it's like, uh, okay, well, I want that. Nope, you got to do something for it. It's like a secret society. It's really common in Gnosticism. So the flesh is bad. It's one of the, the hallmarks of Gnosticism. And then there's this secret knowledge. He's writing to, uh, this letter to this person or church, and, and that's what's happening with them. And so what he says is this. Let what you have heard from the beginning abide in you. If what you've heard from the beginning abides in you, then you too will abide in the Son and in the Father. What is he saying? He's saying, you don't have to know some special something. In fact, in fact, if you look up, if you were to just type in Amazon, Christian book, <laughs> the number of like Da Vinci Code, super secret, like you got to have the right code to get the secret knowledge, right? Like these Bible mystery things. Like if you take a computer and you run all the different algorithms and all of a sudden it says something like, I don't know, Jesus is coming back in April of 27, right? This is so important. If God wanted his revelation to be confusing, he could have done it. Think about that. If he wanted it to be an uncrackable code, friends, he has good encryption. He's God. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, he would never do that. He would never say, I want, I want this to be plain, and I want the secret knowledge to be 32-bit encryption. Because that is how you love people. No. 
No, there is, like, like, the scriptures are an open banquet. If he wanted intelligent, educated people to read it, he would have never had it written in Kone Greek. It's a common Greek. It's slang. Like, there's classic Greek existed at the time. But all of the commoner folks would have never been able to read it. Like, if he wanted it to be confusing, he would, if he wanted secret knowledge, he would have kept it secret. No, this is what John is saying. He's saying, friends, the secret things that you're looking for is just something to distract from abiding in the truth. So, so often people will say, hey, man, but isn't there more? It's like, no, believe the gospel, apply it to every aspect of your life. Yeah, but isn't there like more than that? It's like you can't graduate from that. You'll die before you fully um, and, and integrate yourself into that. Yeah, but isn't there like more? It's like there's not. You don't graduate from it. But what we want is more, don't we? John's pushing against that, against that idea. The reason why Gnosticism worked in the first century and it's coming back in through uh, really uh, terribly written Christian books uh, is because all of us have this secret place in our hearts where we kind of want to know the secrets. It's like, I kind of want to know the secrets. I don't want what's plainly known and really hard to apply every day. I'd rather just keep learning things. It, it's kind of like the, the, the guy, and if you're in here, I'm sorry, but like the guy who just keeps going back to school for more education because he really doesn't want to work. You, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Like, I've, met a, I've had a couple of these friends where it's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to do uh, premarital counseling. And I was like, okay, cool. And then you're going to then you're gonna marry Susie? He's like, no, and then we're going to go to another class. And I was like, okay. And then, and then we're going to do another, another class. And it's like, oh, I got it. I know this song. Mm-hmm. You ain't marrying Susie, are you? No, I am totally going to marry Susie. He's like, really? He never married Susie. <laughs> Just lots and lots of classes, lots and lots of premarital work. We do this the same way. No, we say, hey, the gospel is this. Apply the truth that Jesus came to save sinners, and all of us are sinners. Apply that to your life and your marriage. Grace and mercy in your marriage. Yeah, but isn't there something more? No, that's enough for you. It's enough. Yeah. What about parenting? Yeah, mercy, grace. They're sinners. If they're five, they're going to act like they're five. Apply. Ap ap apply the gospel to that. But isn't there more? No, that's, that's about it. There's no secrets? No. And then Jesus returns. Simple, really. And this is what he's getting at. He's saying, let us, let us from the beginning abide in what we have heard, and then you will abide in the Son and the Father. And listen, this is what just has me screaming blessed assurance. And verse 25, and this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. Amen. Oh, guys, it's amazing. And before, and listen, there's some Christians in here that maybe, doesn't, maybe you don't know. Listen, we don't, we're not like spirit cherubs, you know, with like super cute hair and wings, you know, chubby, harp, ring. Like, that's, like, that does not sound like a good heaven, does it? Like, I think after, like, I think for the first three or four minutes, I'd be like, this is pretty awesome. I'm literally sitting on a cloud. It feels like an easy boy. And then I think I'd be like, I kind of want to do something else. No, nope, eternity. Ring. Ring. I mean, like, even now, I'm starting to feel a tad crazy thinking what that would be like eternally. No, no, no. No, no eternity. It is it's literally an embodied self. Like, we, we get our bodies back. Or if, if Jesus returns and we are still living, then, then we're caught up in the air with those that emerge from the ground in resurrection. And then the new Jerusalem lands in the middle of a redeemed and beautiful earth. And the gates that are singular pearls are open so that we can enjoy the earth. It's going to be amazing. No sunburn. No tears. It's going to be amazing. And, and verse 25 is a blessed assurance that, and this is the promise that he made to us. This is John, the only one of the disciples, the only one of the apostles that didn't go to his death. And at the end of his life, he's like, 
eternal life. You get the sense that he's just like, he's like, oh, I can't wait to go be with my Lord and Savior. And then it's like, hold on, you got one more book to write, and then I'm taking you home, right? I need you to write Revelation so we can freak out Christians for millennia. <laughs> and, and, then, and then you're going home, right? Like you get the sense that that's it's like, hey, I got one more thing for you, right? Right? And, and just for the record, we're going to do Revelation eventually. It's an amazing book, but it has freaked people out for a long time. Verse 26, I write these things to you about those who are trying to deceive you. The scariest. No, so what is the deception? Jesus isn't really the Christ. Friends, this is not like deception about like, hey, how do we baptize? Like what's the, the, the method or mode, uh, mode of, a, of a baptism? This is not about like, do we accept this type of person or this type of person for membership? Or this isn't about like, is the atonement limited or unlimited? Like, no, 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 no. This is unbelievably heavier than that. It is, is Jesus satis- a satisfactory, is his death satisfactory for access to God? Is he the anointed Messiah? Verse 27. But the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, and you have no need that anyone should teach you. But this anointing teaches you about everything that is true. And it is no lie. Just as it has taught you, abide in him. Now, does this mean that we don't need to be taught anything? No, 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 no. No, what it's saying is, because of the resident spirit, because we have been anointed with the spirit. Now, we could go to a number of passages here. Acts 10 and verse 38, we see where, where Jesus is, um, or excuse me, in Acts 10, we see where the spirit comes and, and brings truth. We could go to the, to the abiding passage that everybody loves in John 14, John 15. And so, but no, when the spirit seals the believer, it testifies to what's true. Like there's just this thing where you can read God's word. It illuminates our mind, as Spurgeon has already said. And there's this idea where we can see what God is at hand. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat across from non-Christians and I've gone through the gospel of John and I'll just say, hey, what do you think about that? And they say, I have no idea. Like the words don't even look like they're in order. And I'll say, hey, let's pray. We'll pray. God, illuminate this person. Let them see what your word says. Father, would you do a work? And if they're not Christians, would you save them? Would you give them the spirit so the spirit would testify to what is true? And friends, I'm not exaggerating. The next week, I'll sit down. There's one fellow in particular that I specifically remember in a discipleship relationship. The next week, he'd say, hey, man, this weirdest thing happened to me. I was like, what's that? He said, I went to bed that night. I woke up the next morning, and literally, I am thinking about that passage, and it makes total sense to me. I said, huh, what do you attribute that to? He said, I really felt like I needed a good night's sleep. (laughs) I was like, okay. Maybe so. Maybe so. But to watch this person be illuminated by the Spirit. D.L. Moody says this. It's wonderful. It's a quip. It's a little quip, which is fun. He says this. The Bible without the Holy Spirit is a sundial by moonlight. Doesn't work, does it? Well, I mean, maybe on a full moon to be like, man, this thing is really off. It's not telling me a single thing, right? No. The illumination of the Spirit and what, what is the big idea of this? The big idea is this. There are deceivers. There, the, the spirit of Antichrist. There are Antichrists everywhere. And I will, let me finish through 29 and I'll land with the application. Verse 28. And now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from the shame at his coming. The second coming. That's what the church is waiting for. The church believes, the Bible reveals, that Jesus Christ is coming again. And he's coming again to judge the living and the dead. And and that is a glorious day. It's a blessed day for the Christian. Verse 29, and if you know that he is righteous, you may know for sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Every age, it seems like the plan of God that in every age, it feels like there is a spirit of Antichrist. Like, so like in World War II, everybody thought it was Hitler, right? I mean, how could you not? And that's why I make the joke about the 80s and Gorbachev and the little thing on his face, right? Like that was, like I read some of the books from the 80s. They were terrible, 
to, uh, aligning uh, the Antichrist with Gorbachev. And I'm, and I'm not making the joke. There, there are people that would say, oh, it was Bill Clinton, or it was this president, or it was this person. And listen, friends, this is so critical. Every age feels like the age where Jesus is going to return because the enemy who is in opposition of God's plan, he does not know when Jesus will return. He knows the prophecies. Like if we have a pretty, if we know uh, eschatologically or as it relates to end times, if we know that Jesus is going to return and he's going to make war against uh, the powers of darkness, if we know that from the Bible, you don't think that Satan knows that from the Bible? Come on. He knows this Bible better than we do. So in every age, he has to be ready with those that can usher in Antichrist. He doesn't know when it's going to happen, but he's got the deck set for it. So every age of the Christian feels like this is the last age. I mean, every age feels like, oh man, this is the age that Jesus is going to, is going to come. Look at all the spirit of Antichrist there. Look at this movement, or look at this way to offend God, or look at this type of thing. Every age feels that. In fact, that was the best part about going back, and I went back to the 1600s, and you just keep looking at all the different writers, and what they'll say is, surely this is the time that Jesus will return because of this person or because of these contemporary events. Surely this is the age, and guess what? My contemporaries are writing the same thing. Surely because of this new thing that offends God, and I can add to whatever thing, <coughs> surely because of that, this is the time that Jesus is going to return. And that's really good pressure. Why? The only reason we have the pressure is because the kingdom of God is advancing. If we did not feel pressure, then I would be very, very nervous. In fact, uh, the, 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 the folks that pray for our church very regularly um, on a Zoom call, and they're just doing some awesome uh, prayer time and spiritual warfare for our church and for me and for the staff, for the elders, and praise God. But this particular Sunday was such a, 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 a good Sunday because, or sorry, this particular prayer time was so good, and I am of the opinion it's because by God's grace, this little church that nobody's going to remember in the future, which is okay, right, is doing all that we know to do to advance the kingdom, and there is opposition against it. It just is. It will happen. The same thing for Prestonwood. When they herald the person of Jesus, they will get the same thing. Ray Mills up here, Hope over here. All of these churches are advancing the kingdom, and the spirit of Antichrist is alive, but the Christian is not without hope. The Christian is not without hope. Go back and read verse 25. And this is the promise he made to us, eternal life. And so, what are you going to do with that? I'll tell you what I've been doing with that. I have been asking this question. Father, would you, would you do a work in me where you illumine your scriptures in my mind, where I don't feel like I can graduate or have to graduate from the gospel? I can just apply the gospel to every area of my life. Would you help me not look for secret knowledge, special little this and that? Would you give me clarity around the central message of the scriptures? And then secondly, would you protect us from deceivers? And listen, every year, the birth pains of the birth of what will be the Antichrist, we will feel them more and more strongly. And that will happen. That will happen. And so this is why it's so important that the church gather. It's why it's so important why the church communes with one another. It's why it's so important that, that we don't huddle in fear, not healthy, but that we gather together and continue to send out. This is what we do until the return of Jesus. Church, if you have your elements, let us transition to the central, to the central act and moment in history, the death of Jesus. I was uh, made fun of. Uh, I was made fun of by a first-time guest or a second-time guest they're watching today. Um, and they, uh, when I said the word, I said, uh, we are to be very cruciform, that is to say that we're to focus on the cross and that, and that the church 
is to walk in cruciformity. And she, and literally, as she's sitting right here, like a couple of rows back, and she just rolled her eyes. She's just like, oh gosh, cruciformity. And then after the service, she said, seriously, cruciformity? Like, that's the nerdiest thing you've ever said. And so I sent her a video of me saying cruciformity um, in slow-mo mode three times. And I said, if you want to know what I'm saying, you'll have to speed up the video. And then I get a video from her, or a message from her and her husband, and they said, I cannot believe you spent the five minutes to do that. <laughs> and I said, I would, inv- I would have invested 30 just to give it back to you. <laughs> Why do we do this? We do this because we want to remember the cross. We want to remember the risen Savior. The spirit of Antichrist is anti what we are doing today. And so we celebrate Christ. On the night that he was to be betrayed, the Bible records that he gathers with his disciples and he takes the matzah bread and he looks at them and he says, and again, this is before the crucifixion. They have seen Roman crucifixions before. They would have never thought that Jesus would be Uh, crucified upon a Roman uh, crucifixion device. That would have been very surprising to them. And so when he says to them, this is my body broken for you, we as disciples look back at the cross and think, yeah, get it. They would be looking forward in confusion, but they would have walked through the receiving of his body. Church, church, let us remember Jesus. Take and eat the body of Christ. Father, we're so thankful for these symbols. And the second symbol is the cup. Fruit of the vine here, grape juice, would have been wine. And he takes the cup and he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. What's the new covenant? Well, the new covenant is simply this, that you believe and confess Jesus Christ is the provision of God. Last week, we called it the propitiation Which is to say that God is satisfied because of the death of Jesus. Yeah, but I'm a sinner. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, that's the whole point. Well, I'm a sinner, but how would I do that if I'm a sinner? Because we are sinners, that's why the new covenant matters. Without the new covenant, we just continue to slaughter goats and try to appease an angry God. He ain't angry. Why? Because that's how satisfying the death of Jesus is. And so we celebrate the new covenant, not the old, the new, in his blood. And so church, let us remember the blood of the new covenant. Father, we take and we drink and we thank you. Father, as we end in this concluding song and as we, uh, as we transition into our member meeting in our time of just a family gathering together, we thank you uh, that we have such an opportunity to eat hot dogs with each other and listen to the updates and here we are financially and all the different things that are happening in schedule. Holy Spirit, come. Would you to give us peace? Would you even now, just for the non-Christians that are in the room, would you just draw them to saving knowledge and just the hole that is in the heart that can only be filled by Christ. May that be so today. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed today's message. For more information, visit our website at lighthousentx.com.